Good morning, everybody. We ready? Okay, I'm John Weddleton. This is the Community Economic Development Committee meeting. Um, Matt, do you want to do our report? Mr. Weddleton? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Here. Mr. Peterson? He's walking in. Walking through the door. Awesome. Say here. Say here. <laughs> Say here, Pete. Present. <laughs> um, Mr. Constant was going to call in. Mr. Dunbar? Here. Ms. Alta? Here. Jerry, you have form. Thank you. So let's go ahead and go around the room real quick and see who's here. So, interpreter or Phil? I'm Phil Steyer from Chief Oh. Melinda Tsu, PMA project manager. Bob Dole, the building official. Christy Bishop, Burger Watershed Management. Jeff Urbanis with Watershed Management. Uh, Chris Shady, Account and Community Development. Tim Shiragi, Signature Learning Services. And Ben Shiragi, Signature Learning Services as well. And walking in the door. Julie Magla, pm &E, Project Administrator. Um, pm &E just put out an RFP for the West Anchorage Snow Disposal Site for the municipality. Oh, good. Good, thanks. So first up, we have anything uh, changes the agenda? Oh, I'm sorry, we did oh, forgot the table. Michelle McNulty, Planning Department. Dan Alvino, Dating of the Council. Ryan Yale, Planning Department. Mandy Honest, Clerk's Office. Right, thanks for that. Um, any changes in the agenda? Okay. So moving right along, we have Three marijuana licenses and all three of the same owner, same location. Yes. And I think we probably just go through one at a time, but it should go fairly quickly. Okay. Okay. So, um, Matt, do you want to start with the Cold City? Sure. Um, so, Cold City Cannabis. This is for the retail license. All of the license restrictions um, were addressed in their operating plan. Uh, there were originally taxes, fees, and fines found due, but they've been paid, so it was not listed as a condition. Um, all of the safety and security standards were also addressed in their operating plan. They addressed all of the retail license-specific requirements um, in the operating plan as well. The only thing, um, just if concentrates are sold, um, it wasn't mentioned, but make sure they're stored properly, temperature control and all that. And there were no other conditions recommended for the license. All right, thank you. Um, Ryan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kind of got all three licenses turned into one kind of synopsis here. But, uh, it's a request for a special use permit for marijuana retail, manufacturing, and cultivation within an Iowa district. The site is located southeast of the intersection of East 70th Avenue and Briarwood Street. The proposed establishment will be located within an existing industrial structure. It's actually the old uh, Yummy Chummies factory. Mm -hmm. uh, approximately 658 square feet of available building space will be dedicated to marijuana retail. Uh, 14,010 square feet for cultivation and 457 square feet for manufacturing. Uh, this retail sales establishment will be open uh, seven days a week, uh, in the end until midnight. And the closest protected land use is a religious assembly approximately 790 feet away from the petition site. Uh, there are unresolved issues with the proposed site plan as well as the parking lot layout to include a parking reduction for uh, bicycle parking spaces. Uh, that has not been granted yet from the traffic department. Discrepancies in the parking calculations and the provided uh, site plans. An accessible route to the front entrance, uh, the driveway width uh, exceeds allowable width, uh, and the signage of accessible parking spaces. Uh, there's also a fence located within the right of way at East 70th Avenue, which will need to be granted an encroachment permit by the right of way section in order to remain. Uh, or the fence could be moved, or the fence could be. Um, and these items are addressed in conditions seven and eight, uh, special land use permit. And this use is consistent with the Anchorage 2040 land use plan and the provided site plans to not show any major alterations to the building facade or structure that make it up to similar character scale or size. Uh, with compared to surrounding structures, and the planning department recommends approval of the special land use permit subject to the conditions that stated in the staff. All right, thank you. Is there any comments from the sound? The, uh, Pete? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The only thing that I noticed was that um, they're mentioning that there's another licensee within a thousand feet, the Babylon Company, but then in the application earlier when it asked if there was any other businesses, it said there was none. Uh, we might have missed them. I don't just to didn't know, whether, so didn't, know whether, didn't know if Babylon was still there or not. So I just wanted to. Yeah, I, I, I think they're still so. yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, I, you know, following up on that, I you know that in, um, Ryan, in your report, you said there was a religious establishment 790 feet away. But in the um, applicants, you mentioned two, Barika Church, Unity, Unity of Anchorage, half a mile away. I think you, you, you said that wasn't so picking. Uh, I just list the closest. Oh, okay. yeah, we just we just did it within a mile, whatever yeah. within a mile. But but you listed them as half a mile, so maybe they were closer than that. Half a mile? No, it's half a mile. And then you listed one as seven hundred. Closer. Yeah. So there's a uh, Korean church. I can't think of the name. Right. Call the name, but um, it's located along just off the of old sewer. Yeah. So how did you miss that then? I guess I missed. That. I thought you said I listed two churches. You listed two, but you said they were each half a mile away. And in Ryan's report, he said there's one. He didn't identify, but you said 790 feet. So okay. somehow you missed one. I must have missed that one. That was 700 feet. Where you get? How do you get your information on that? Well, we look on Google, and then we look on the Muni map, and then we go and look on foot. And sometimes churches don't really look like churches. So the Korean really church is, I mean, has a big sign. And it's not. I mean, it, I mean, obviously you're good on this, but it's. You know, if someone, I just want to make sure we have a good system for this. If someone's renting a place and they miss one and they go through a lot of money and then they find out, oh shoot, that's a Yeah. Well, we usually sure. run the address pass planning before we initiate it. I'm sure we go to this one. And I, I don't know how it was that Korean church. Yeah. Religious assemblies can be very difficult to locate sometimes. I mean, some of them, they might have a big giant sign, and some of them, it's just the front doors marked. And to be in a heavy industrial area, and you'd never know without actually walking onto the property or reading what the door said. Do you know if this Korean one was on the mini map? I believe it is. Okay. Um, okay, there's also in the back um, comments from traffic said the um, current and proposed pavement exceeds the maximum allowance. I didn't know he had a maximum. Uh, they didn't carry through to your comments. I believe that's for the driveway width. Oh, well, that's the driveway um, width. Okay. We don't have a maximum allowed, though. It's just, I mean, that would it's just the width of the driveway. Be the width of the driveway, yeah. So you can pave, you know, as long as you weren't. Um, yeah, your other requirements are required landscaping and things like that, but um, all the parking and circulation areas you can pay them. We don't have a, a maximum you know, amount of impervious surface on site. Okay. Um, good question. So, for the applicant, so you have a list of conditions. Have you seen it? Yeah. Is that what, and are those? Yeah, like Problems the possible, or? no, they're not. Okay. All those are being taken care of by architectural uh, planning. So I got a question, why are you going for a reduction for having a bicycle parking? Do you have enough parking already? Um, what do you mean by reduction? Something that we showed a, a bicycle. Um, I think the architect showed a bicycle right. rack on the site plan, right? Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if they're going to apply for a, a reduction. If there's enough parking spaces, you wouldn't. But if, I, I think that maybe it might be short parking space. But uh, I think you have you required 16. I think yeah. you 16. So, so they might have just put it on there. The architects might have just put it on there. To oh, okay. I was just curious if there what, what was going on. Okay. Is there anything else on this? Recommendation? Obviously, they've got a couple of things to do with yeah. the parking lot. Yeah. 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 Looks like it's in order. I make a motion to recommend approval with um, with the conditions as stated by the by staff. Yeah. Second. Did you get that? And, uh, okay. Any opposition? 
Okay, so what we do is this goes up in front of the full assembly on Tuesday. Right. And we'll bring them up one at a time and we'll have a public hearing, which usually goes up that fast. And we'll state that this committee recommended approval, but it's not, this isn't really the decision. Right. The decision is the vote right. on Tuesday. So. Okay, uh, moving on to the cultivation, Tundra Farm. Um, so this is Tundra Farms, um, same owner applicant. Um, this is their cultivation license. Um, since it's the same location, um, similarly, all of the general license uh, restrictions and requirements are addressed in their operating plans. Um, and the cultivation specific requirements they also address. Um, there was just the comment from the health department about documenting the smell at the um, property line. Um, there were no extra conditions recommended for the license. Great, thank you. Ryan? Uh, so there was a lot of uh, previous presentation. Um, the only additional condition that was added to the cultivation was uh, resolving the matter of uh, the necessity for a type B loading birth just due to the size of the cultivation. Just clarification, what is that? What is that? Hey, How much more of it? Yeah, what are you installing there? Uh, just be so you could back up uh, like a straight truck for deliveries. So it's just... Big garage door. So just retrofitting the, the outside. It's not like building an extension or anything onto the building. It's just a retrofit of a garage door type. It, it would depend on... Uh, how the building is constructed currently, whether you need to modify it or if it's just showing the type of living birth that already exists, or um, if they were constructing or they're trying to get, uh, remove it. But yeah, either they have to install it or uh, apply for variance to not install it. Okay. Now, my understanding of the birth is basically going to show you can't have parking there because you have to have space for the truck to move. So it's really more of a, you can't double up on parking and a backing up space for the truck. Is that, is that mostly the issue? Correct, yeah. So it's not really a structure on the building so much. Yeah. You just have to show that you have space for the truck to back up, not just because there's 17 cars filling the whole space. So Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So are you planning to to, to build a, a, a unloading berth? Um, I'm not sure yet. It doesn't seem like we need one. There's three fake garage yeah, right now, so the, the issue will be making sure they're the type B, and if they're not the type B, figuring out the cost of installing the type B and then or doing the variance. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I noticed in the last application, the community council memorandum is with Tundra Farms, but that was actually for Cold City Cannabis, and then there aren't memorandums in these other two uh, packets. Yeah. From the um, community council, um, is it intended that the memorandum from the license that we just talked about, uh, 18702, should go with the other two as well from the community council? So the code requires us to do community engagement for all marijuana license types, but only memorandums for retail. So we did the presentation to the community council for all three on the same day and presented everything, passed our plans. Um, but we only had them sign a memorandum of understanding for the retail. That's the wrong name. Yeah, because we changed the name. Um, we applied for a, a change of business name. Okay, and did you yeah. notify the community council that you've done that? So the, I don't know if AMGO has that process where they send out notices, but what it, it, it yeah, mm -hmm. they do. So they would get, they would have gotten a notice, okay. but we didn't go back to them after we changed it to Cold City Campus. Okay, thanks. Crystal. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the fencing. Sure. Um, uh, it looks like uh, you're going to have to move it if you don't get a right of way variance. So, where are you in that process? What, what that part of the fence? Yeah. The back side or? Well, it talks about it being a right of way on East 70th Avenue. Um, that there's an encroach, encroachment of the fence. Yeah, so that was an existing fence. Um, 
Yeah, that's what I was looking at first. Yeah. Um, that was an existing fence, so we've got to see if we can get the variance, and if we can get the variance, great. If we can't, then we're going to have to move it. Okay, and then what kind of a process is that? Just for, okay, thanks, Ryan. Just, just for clarification, it would be an encroachment permit uh, issued by the right of way section. Um, we have staff that can speak to that process. They submit, yeah. it, they will uh, submit plans, we'll take a look at it, the connectivity, et cetera, and see if it's viable to leave it there or not. Okay. And In and most cases, we want to move back to the property line on the right of way. Does that sense, land sets a little smaller, can't make it, make it out of sense? But you decide that. That's all decided internally, and you make that decision uh, in the department itself. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So it's not a variance. A variance is a high bar. It's an enforcement permit to allow for remain on public property. Okay. okay, anything else? You know, I noticed um, for Ryan, just on your write up, uh, page two roughly five lines down, you say 475 square feet, you say dedicated retail for the cultivation. Okay. That's a typo. Cut and paste. Yeah. Oops. Okay, anything else? And that should say dedicated to manufacturing, is that what, or? Well, I'm sorry, no, I'm, this is, when I said that, that's on the manufacturing one problem. So okay. we hit the manufacturing. That's what I'm sorry. Okay, anything else? Got a recommendation? Yeah, I'll make a recommendation. Second? Second. Second from Meg. Any opposition? Okay, so we'll move to approve or recommend approval on this one with the small conditions. Okay, the last one here is the manufacturing tender farms. So Tundra Farms, um, manufacturing license again, same premises, um, so same licensing uh, restrictions for all three have been addressed in the operating plan. Um, their safety and security standards were also addressed in that um, operating plan. The manufacturing specific license re uh, restrictions were addressed in the operating plan as well, and there were no extra conditions recommended for the manufacturing license. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The only uh, special condition added to this one um, is pretty standard for manufacturing facilities, but it's just provide the planning and certification from an industrial hygienist or a professional engineer uh, in accordance with the Department of Municipal Code that you know, all the equipment that they're using and the processes that they're using are safe and meet industry standards. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? No, Chris, yet. Mm -hmm. be texted, but Recommendation? Looks like you're the guy. I guess I'll move to recommend. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any opposition? Okay, so Tuesday, you come up. We usually put these at the end of the agenda. Janet can guide you, I'm sure. Okay. And then, uh, and like I said, we'll when it comes up, we'll state that we recommend the approval and then we'll go to a full vote. So appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Well, thanks. Appreciate your comment. Thank you. Actually, I, I see Phil is here. <coughs> Are they set up okay for their for their electricity? Yes, uh, based upon the anticipated load that they have given us, the existing service is sufficient to serve. Thank you. Just while you're up and we're transitioning, have you hit any problems with cultivation, pull, pull too much electricity? Not. Um, I can't say never. We had one case where we put in a transformer that we replaced with a different transformer, and that was just a matter of the plans we had weren't the final plans. Um, but in terms of draw on the system and the inability, for instance, to keep up with it, no. Um, and I have to say that Jana and I had this conversation just the other day, that one of the best things that everyone did was approve an ordinance that had a line in it requiring applicants for a special land use permit to talk to their utility in advance and get a letter. It really has eliminated a whole lot of uh, potential problems. So. so we score that as a win. Who keeps track? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks.
Okay, so next topic is um, snow disposal sites. And this, um, Chris recommended we add it. I don't know, are we, do you have a presentation? Or? Yeah, we're going to, it's going to be my cell phone, Dole, and Chris Dish on okay. But we have, just on the screen, we just have a map of all of the snow disposal sites throughout Anchorage, including Eagle River, Girdler, um, just for a point of reference. Okay, and just, I, I'd invited Tim and Jennifer to come because they built their own private snow disposal site, and I know we had talked once and they had a lot of thoughts on it. So we're looking at different changes or so on, which is we have hopefully keep them involved and yeah. move forward. So. And I don't think the, I think the purpose of today's meeting is less um, to talk about some changes, but more just to give an overview of okay. kind of the bigger picture of why we have snow disposals. Um, and then just various, you know, how alternatives to sort of storage sites have been evaluated throughout the years, why we need to continue to look at other spots, um, and in the process for that design, we're happy to, we have a lot of time to answer any questions and we can talk about if there needs to be changes. Okay, good. We don't have any that we'll be presenting. And I also have uh, Jack with us who can talk about land use enforcement and how we go about looking at snow site complaints and issues. Okay, great. Is there, do we have a light or is this? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so on the screen, um, Bob's going to start this to really talk about kind of the importance of service proposals, but just to give everybody an idea of how many we have and where they're located. Um, so there is an interactive map. This is both in the GIS maps gallery as well as Watershed Management has this on their, um, their website, and this is part of the MS4 permit that the city has. And so the ones in purple are privately owned and operated, the ones in the, the green our uh, government, and that can include both state and or the city. Crystal. Yeah. Michelle, can you kind of point those out? Oh, you're making it. Yeah. So that helps. So that, <laughs> I, I kind of that. Yeah, it's <laughs> a very, <laughs> too many little dots. Yeah, and so okay. just a real quick overview. Right. So we have like one up in Eagle River. I think mean, I might have yeah. too yeah. far. Yeah. I'm not in Eagle River. Yeah. One Eagle River. Um, and then down to Gurwood, but we have very few there. So we're going to concentrate on the bowl, but we can pan this thing as you can see. Um, and so I don't know if you click on one of them, it, it will bring up the, it'll yeah. bring up the information about it. So, like the address. Yeah. And, then, and who operates it as well. And so this is a really nice interactive website that's on, um, like I said, Watershed Management's homepage, and then also just in the Maps and Maps Gallery, which is GIS. So in terms of looking at snow site, uh, snow dump sites, I think it, you know as a starting point we should recognize that like uh, trash pickup and disposal, it is a vital, uh, not glamorous, not particularly uh, you know, attractive, but a, uh, a vital role and mission that is played in the municipality of Anchorage seven or eight months out of the year, both in the safety in terms of just not being able to use property. We have decades of design criteria and land use regulations that are premised on the idea that you don't have to snow your whole store, your whole season's uh, snow on your property, but rather can be removed and sent elsewhere. And frankly, that's vital. Without that, development would be far less than we have today uh, going back. And unlike uh, stormwater, snow doesn't uh, resolve itself. It doesn't evaporate. It doesn't sublimate. It just hangs out till May if you don't do something there. He's, uh, I know that you all know this. We're all Alaskans, but just uh, I think it's one of those important baseline things we need to remind ourselves that it is important for Anchorage from a safety standpoint and just a usability standpoint. If I look at our right-of-way staff, what they do in the winter is they're not doing right-of-way inspections for subdivisions that are covered with snow. Instead, they're dealing with complaints about neighbors pushing the snow onto each other's property where snow disposal is uh, inadequate. Also, snow disposal sites are in short supply, desperately short supply in the community and present a significant challenge in terms of those sites. If you look at our increase in density, our increase in paved areas and our decrease in land available for such sites, that I-2 land, um, it makes it really difficult. Uh, the alternatives are pretty limited to a snow disposal site. There have been studies that looked at why can't you just go melt it somewhere? Well, the fuel is cost prohibitive for doing that, and then you end up with all this water with all the salt and stuff. And there's Hello? Yeah, let me put you on speaker. 
Okay, bye. He's got to call back on another phone. Is that Chris? <laughs> yeah. I would also add that um, consolidation creates more problems uh, uh, than having that dis distribution of sites you see up there. As you consolidate, you increase uh, road traffic, you increase fuel emissions, you also increase cost to both the private and public landowners uh, as the travel distance increases. So even if you have a fantastic facility at, say, uh, one off by Eagle River or something, the price of hauling snow from uh, South Anchorage is cost prohibitive. So I, I think that gets into kind of the overview of the importance of snow sites and at snow dump sites, and I hand it to Michelle to um, talk about just those different ones there and the different statuses of them. Yeah, so we were, as part of this exercise, we were actually trying to pull it together, um, which ones are really not conforming, so predate any Title 21 requirements, which ones are covered under old Title 21, and which ones are under new. And when I say that, it's because snow disposal sites have historically been, um, in, in the most recent past, and allowed only through a conditional use process in most of the districts and our industrial areas they are permitted um, through an administrative site plan review but most of disposal sites do actually require making a conditional use permit that um, over the years we have increased the design criteria to match the, the environmental concerns as well as public concerns as these sites become more prevalent in urban and built up environments um, so we weren't able to pull it together but, um, in, in time for this meeting, but we are actively doing that. But okay. just to say that, speaker. It's okay. a lot of the sites that you see today are pretty much uh, non-conforming, so they were built to basically limited to no standards. As we move forward with introducing snow disposal sites into the area, there are a lot of um, different requirements, including um, how high you can stack the snow. That's not just a, a visual uh, cue, but that's also just to help with better snow melt. Um, we also require landscaping, and again, that's both functional and aesthetic. It, it blocks the view in an urban environment, but it also provides um, a barrier, so as the snow melts and the trash, when it comes up to the surface, that it doesn't blow away. So um, most of the requirements are both aesthetic, but they're, they're highly functional as well, to making sure that these can operate in like I said, in every context, because the reality is they are becoming more prevalent in, in building environments. I think there's a bunch of questions. No, oh, okay. Uh, my, so I guess just clarity. So we have several non-conforming sites, yeah. and the EPA is not, there's no pushback on that yet? <coughs> so, and that's kind of a good segue. <laughs> okay. yeah. First thing is that exactly so. I'm shocked. Um, no, and so when, when I talk about what's <coughs> non-conforming and what can be grandfathered, I'm talking about site design. But Christy okay. is going to go into okay. what is it oh, can't be grandfathered. And actually, let's just go right there. I think that's, I think it's what I actually. I have a question oh. that frame. Uh, so what what's the year where we, where we kind of made the cutoff? Or conforming versus non-conforming, where we put the new, you know, where, so we can tell, you know, based on the age of the snow dome. Um, I, I, there that's a good question, and I don't know if it was in 2009 the initial design. And I'll I mean, let me get confirmation. Okay. Um, sure. I, didn't, I, I think another way to answer that question is there, there's not a hard and fast cutoff. Right. Non-conformity occurs when what was current, what was once acceptable, the rules change. Uh, so I think one, if you're looking for a demarcation, one demarcation would be 2014 when there was a transition from old Title 121 to new Title 21. But that's really kind of a hard question to answer. There's no single point in time where things become conforming or not conforming. It will depend on each site and what the uh, zoning rules is. It's strictly zoning we're talking about conforming. Right, and so uh, we're in place at that time. So, so what I was going to say is what we do is so those are the different cutoffs, but as each site comes forward, we look at it individually and say, okay, this one was in 1950, there was no zone, so it predates anything, or mm -hmm. this one was established in uh, 2006 and it should apply to these standards, or if it was 2014, so it should have current. And that's, and that's not something on the map, so if I go click on one, I'm not going to be able to, I'm going to have to inquire you, about you, this you, one. If you, click, if you click on the map, it'll, so like, uh, if you go down to like uh, American Landscaping, O'Malley, or C, C and O'Malley, right? There, if you click on it, you'll see like grandfather. Oh, you will see? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
So can we fit? Is that true of any of these? Yeah. So. This is a part of the Let him drive for a second. Yeah. So. Oh, grandfather. Okay. Yeah. So like oh. that would be was the, the one that's known as Gary's trapping. And then there's a bunch of snow dumps down this neck of the woods and you'll get grandfather. Okay. Thanks. Um so then if it's permanent, okay. How old is it? And then uh yeah. that's the Shraggies. So if it's this permanent status, yes, does that mean that it has a current it, that would be the have, yeah, like an administrative cycle. Okay. And maybe just to mention too, and I think this is probably where Christy was going to go with it as well. Some of the criteria for snow dumps is uh, the newest criteria for snow dumps is laid out in the new, D new DCM. Thank you. Okay, Forrest. I apologize if you already said this, but approximately how many snow dumps do we have in the Anchorage City Bowl? And then how many have been? Built or are being built since 2014, since the new Title 21 went into effect. I can I can answer that last question. I think um, Jeff and I answered the, the first question. So we've had two that have come in under the new Title 21, and that is the Shroggy's signature um, landscape that, site. That tiny little yeah. correct. And then um, a Klukna has a stone disposal site on it. What's called Site Four, um, and it's out um, out past Kata Reserve, so along the railroad. Um, by Clean Lake, so adjacent to Jay Bear. So since we put in the new Tower 20, 21 with more stringent requirements, the entire Anchorage Bowl with this one tiny little plot here is the only snow dump we've built in five years. There's been a municipal one, like, well, Spruce Street. Spruce Street, Spruce Street okay. just around, is that, that used yeah. the new criteria, but I don't know if that the new criteria was in, in effect then. Right. That came in under old Tower 21, so it had a condition, it has a conditional use permit, but but, so perhaps this is why we're here, is, is basically the implication that new Title 21 has basically made it impossible, or nearly impossible for private entities to build snow dumps. I, I don't think that that's an accurate statement. I, I would suspect that... Uneconomical? Uneconomical, but challenging. Um, challenging. I mean, you, you can hear from the Shragis yeah. if you like, but it's challenging. That's part of the exercise today for us. The, the rules, particularly on the zoning side, are very stringent, and but it higher level discussion that we hope to have is it, it also is a desperate need for this community. So it's a tough line to walk. I would also say that part of the, the problem is just the availability of land and the sure. versus the code being too stringent. So kind of to this issue, this one right here, the, these guys are going through um, like a change in site design right now and that one's going through like as part of the change in site design they're going through under the new criteria. Okay, so that one I drive by there six times a day and that looks like just in the last year or so it's has it been there for a long time and I've just noticed it. I did. It's been there for a while. <laughs> That's funny, I just noticed, oh look, a big snow dump. So okay. you also might be an change because they kept that land free. Well that might be it. Yeah, the buffer is gone. <laughs> Which they put it what are those rooms? <laughs> <laughs> South Acreage Sports Park. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, sorry. Oh, and actually, what triggered the the, re the site design there? Like, what what triggered some changes being done? So, if I recall correctly, they had not made full utilization of the space that was there, and some the stuff that was previously cleared had kind of gone fallow. And then they just because there's need, they just wanted to expand the facility, and then. And then everything. Yeah, that kind of love. You, you know, when you don't use something, you lose something. And then when they wanted to expand to their full property, they kind of kicked into the. Okay. So just real quick on non-conforming. So when you have a non-conforming determination, essentially how the site is functioning at the time is what gets kind of grandfathered as the approved site plan. So someone could have a 40 acre site and they were using 20 acres at their disposal. So they wanted to, to regrade or redesign the site and, and change it in an area that had not historically been used. They would then have to come in and do an amendment to that de facto approved site plan to make those changes. And then they have to start bringing the site into conformance. But it's not that the grandfather rights just cover the whole entire property and hey, you're, you're good to go wherever you want. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Moving on. Well, so to answer your question about the EPA, the uh, these sites cannot be grandfathered for water quality because EPA won't allow us to. And so, 
no matter what their status is for grandfathering, Title 21 says that they will not be grandfathered for, for runoff. So the municipality has its own snow disposal sites and watershed management has worked with street maintenance over the years to come up with best practices to apply to the snow disposal sites and then we are transferring that as that information as best we can to these more challenged uh, space sites that you see around town that we were just looking at. And so with new sites coming in, we have design criteria that they have to apply and put in place from the very beginning. And they have a chance of being most <coughs> successful with that. Now the sites that have existed over time, we're working with them on a case-by-case -case basis to try to improve the runoff coming from their sites. And one thing we found is that a lot of these sites use, uh, you, they use their site for snow disposal in the winter, but in the summer, they're using it for landscaping or soil storage, uh, dirt, topsoil, that kind of thing. And that's an awful mixed use because the snow comes in and in the spring, you can imagine what the runoff looks like. So we're trying to correct those practices in Anchorage right now. And that's, I think, one of our biggest issues. So the things that we look for when we're, when we're trying to work with these people to improve water quality are mainly salt from what goes down on the parking lots and sediment. And the salt we manage by trying to help them keep their water on site for a longer period of time because the salt melts out of the snow piles right away in the spring, like in April. And then it's really concentrated. And so if we can get the, the melt water stored on site for a period of time, the rest of the melt water comes along and dilutes the salt and makes it uh, more of a concentration that can be um, environmentally acceptable. So that's that's one thing is, is detention of meltwater. So, so with the, if you use it for snow storage and then for soil later, is a problem that you pile a bunch of soil on there and then that runoff is carrying it into the exactly. streams. Or something. Exactly. It's just dirt, dirt in the water. Chocolate milk, yeah. yeah. So the other thing then is the sediment, as you just pointed out, We're trying to find ways to um, manage the ground, prep the ground so that there isn't a lot of dirt to be carried away, and then storing the snow on the sites during the winter to minimize the pathway that the meltwater is taking from across the, across the snow pad to the receiving water site. That's not obvious, but the longer the water is running across the land, the more opportunity it has to pick up dirt and carry it away. So how we load the snow into the site is actually a practice that helps water quality, believe it or not. And then just having a receiving water identified with the sites that that is protected with with berms or or whatever is needed to minimize the amount of dirt that's coming into the receiving system whether there's a storm drain nearby or a ditch or um, maybe if if they're lucky they have a, a, a nearby wetland that's going to filter all the water before it goes out into, into uh, well, what we regulate, which is the storm sewer system. So, oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so, uh, does, does it complicate things if we get a January thaw or rain in the middle of the winter where we have a, an unexpected melt-off at, at some of these uh, snow dumps? Well, uh, it can't, well, if, if they have multiple breakups, then they've got to go through this multiple times. And so a lot of them have to put uh, practices in place as the snow starts to melt to try to keep it from running out of their driveways, etc. 
So they would have to do that multiple times, and that is, it's, it's a bother for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so trying to keep the water on site, this applies to all the snow dumps, yes. period, regardless of when they started. Um, and I know in Midtown we have some that aren't near necessarily what we would think of as like a creek or something. So, so can you tell me about what that might look like or what that might be? Well, uh, a lot of the, uh, well, the, the new ones, for instance, the Shadies have had to put a little pond on their site and it holds the water back, paints it as long as possible to get that, that dilution part. And then it also allows the, the water and the sediment in it to settle a little bit so that as it's moving, you know, it tops, so the water tops the pond and it starts to move out into the road ditch. It, uh, it's a little quieter and it leaves some of that sediment behind. Anything else other than ponds? Uh, there's, uh, well, they sometimes berm it up. Berms. There's other sites that have to create like dirt berms and, and stabilize those dirt berms with, with vegetation. And then that acts as their, as their means of trying to manage the water. Anything else? What, what maybe just to add, like, you know, in terms of the control, some of the, some of the existing snow dumps that went in a million years ago that have um, a dual use, seasonal use, it, they're always going to be chasing the problem because they don't have the, like, the types of controls for holding water and stuff like that. There are uh, uh, just the uses that are inconsistent versus like some of the new sites that come on board. Um, that it's just a lot easier. And so, like if you were to go look at maybe a snow dump in, in this area right here, <coughs> I, that I mean that's that's a chocolate milk mess <laughs> the whole entire time. Versus you go out to Spruce and uh, yeah, yeah. Dowling right there. I mean, and the water that comes out of there is absolutely crystal clear. And, you know, so these folks every year, you know, DOT, whomever is like getting them to clean stuff up and they're always trying to, they're always, but they're always going to be chasing this, you know, they're always chasing the problem. And one of the things that the mix, just if I could add in the discussion, one of the problems with the mixed use sites or the dual use sites, it, it's kind of fast. Christy mentioned the minimizing flow paths and, and that kind of thing for picking up pollutants and sediment. It's kind of best that the snow deflates, and so the you know we, we've all seen like you drive by in July the snow dumps and the and the dirt. If that dirt just deflates in place, then you have the opportunity to pick it up off the pad along with trash and all the rest of it. But a lot of the, the, many of the sites that do two uses, they'll go in April and May, and they start farming their soil, their their snow, and they try and spread it out. Um, they try to get it melt faster so they can get that, that area prepped for you know topsoil screening and the rest of it. And then they're just consistently mixing things up and any melt water that comes off site has the dirt and the, and the rest of it in there. So that's one of the, the challenges. Um, yeah, so I have a question of how, how do we work with like kind of this conflict of rights or requirements. So we have watershed wanting to do one thing, and we have designs that allow, you know, grandfathered uses, <coughs> and we kind of get into this where we, we can't necessarily meet the watershed requirements based on some of these older snow dumps. How do we resolve that conflict? Or well, is there a practice? Is there? We have the no sites have to apply what, as many practices as, as necessary to manage their water. We don't have a choice on that. And then over time it becomes a, uh, whether or not these things are achievable and whether the snow sites can exist with all of the rules placed on them. And so then the, I guess the owner of that snow site comes in as many times as possible to work with the muni on meeting those things. Is, is that 
So you're saying, if I understand correctly, the watershed requirements have to be met kind of no matter what, um, and you guys give it a period of time in order to try and make that happen, and then if that can't happen, that use may no longer be allowed? We typically work with, with the owners as long as necessary. I mean, it, it is an ongoing. We, we've never retracted somebody's use. So again, then I think we have a conflict potentially where we can't necessarily get to meeting the watershed requirements, but we haven't retracted the use. So I guess there's some tension there, and I'm just trying to investigate so, that. So like maybe a good example, there was a construction project here for uh, some pedestrian improvements that DOT was doing, and DOT was on site active in construction projects, so they had other discharges that were, their discharges in general were on their radar. They, they were they every week the, the, the issue kept coming up over and over and over again because it was a grandfathered site that has less than perfect conditions and they I mean they got it right but then you know and then conditions would change it would rain it would get hot or do you know they need to do something else and that's why that's kind of what I meant by you know like some of these other, like the older ones some of, some of the ones that the municipality runs and some of the ones that have gone through have just have better site or went through more a better administrative procedure I mean, it's it's passive. You, you know, you're going out and you're looking at things, and you know, there's nip tuck here, but but it's it's not as so some of some of the some of the sites that are that have like maybe what you're saying like allowances through the zoning that don't that aren't don't match up great with water quality concerns. They got a lot more work to do. Um, just for my Chris, are you able to follow along? Okay. Yes, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, D. Uh, yeah, thank you. When you're working with the owners for uh, managing water, do you have any certain legal enforcement mechanisms that you can find through enforcement orders, things like that? Yeah, we, we've never gone down this road, but we would probably engage code enforcement to assist us with stop work orders or whatever was needed to, to gain some better oversight of the snow disposal. The community pressure, of course, is dependent on how much snow we get in a year and and how many sites are available. You know, snow sites need to exist. And so Watershed is working with with all of that to, to be able to maximize the ability of snow disposal sites to operate and also maximize water quality. And it is a fine line. So just so we have EPA standards we have to meet, but the city's in charge of enforcing those. And does someone from the EPA watch you? Or yes. So, so they'll just. How does that function? Once a year, not once a year. Well, and actually, let me point out that EPA has given primacy to DEC, the, the state, and the state is actually the one who is our regulator. And so, if they see a problem, they contact us because it becomes a violation of the city's permit to discharge. And and that's what the pressure they put on the city to go out and oversee the snow disposal sites. So a private operator who does bad work or whatever gets silt in the water, is the city's in trouble? Yes. And yes. we get fined or what happens? Not so far, but it could happen. Is that how it would work though? We get fined or do they Very shut often us down? we'll get a notice of violation mm -hmm. and then we have to demonstrate the steps we're taking to to close the gap. It could result in a fine. It has not yet. Million dollar fine or five hundred a day? It's or? usually like thirty six thousand dollars per day per occurrence. That's Whoa. that's what's written into the permit. <laughs> Can you say that number again? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. and all the money. So, well, <laughs> that's what the repression was, but. Yeah. Something to the effect of, actually, 36 is the old number. It went to $38,500 per day per occurrence. So then you have to negotiate what the actual fine is going to be. But it's enough so we notice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It would get your attention. So, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Does, does the State Department of Environmental Conservation, they have enough personnel 
to to uh, to supervise this situation, or, or are they down to one person in the entire city of Anchorage now? Or, or they would say not, but they work very uh, well with complaints. If a complaint comes so their way, complaint driven, it comes around. Okay. So, and then if they notice something, uh, they're usually contacting us right away. Okay. Thank you, and brilliant line of questioning. So one of my questions was uh, was answered just in regard to who has the authority and how um, all that works. But um, another question, just from a practical standpoint, can you tell me a little bit, like, what does it take to actually clean the trash out uh, at the end of a snow season? What does that look like? So we, I'm going to take a stab at this, but I think um, probably the Schroeder might be able to talk about it from a real life perspective. Yeah, I would love to hear so that. That to me is fascinating. I can't imagine all that trash. In there. Why don't just to jump in? So, uh, how long is your presentation? Or, I mean, this is a good discussion. We've we worked through it. We like. I think we can get all the questions we need. Right. I would say one final thing. Um, all of this talk about water runoff, water quality, it doesn't apply to um, groundwater and wellhead protection. It's, it's all about the MS4 system, the municipal separate storm sewer system. So when you are dealing with issues that are wellhead protection, it's a different set of regulations that kicks in. Okay, we might want to get to that. So I, I just want to make sure that we have time for Tim and Jennifer to share their thoughts on it too as we to move forward. But, um, so did you have, you didn't have more to go through at this point? No. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's move to the well thing because we did have someone come to speak to us a few months ago about well, the trash. Well, trash. I'm sorry. Do you want to talk about it from a real life perspective? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I could just make a couple of general comments. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, the map you're looking at right now, uh, out of the five private sites you see there, there will likely only be two of those operating this year, which would be ours and the large one at the bottom of the street for a variety of different reasons. One was an enforcement action this winter um, at the site next to ours, and then um, by virtue of some other development, I, I highly doubt that those two sites on the far left are going to be operating on C Street and uh, well, now, And that's indicative of, as a private operator, what we've seen for the last 10 years and the, and the impetus for us to develop a small site on our own to handle our in-house clients. So we don't technically operate for hire as far as like bringing in all kinds of contractors and that type of stuff. It's really a protectionary measure uh, for our for the clients we service. Um, but in the in the last 10 years we've seen probably better than a 50 an effective 50 percent reduction in private snow disposal sites. Um, so it's it is a on the private sector side very challenging. Um, the second piece of that is the development process is, as everybody in the room has said, it's very challenging. You know, the design criteria manual was really designed for large municipal sites and not for developing small, and that was small sites like ours. That was some of the challenges we worked through. And how do you implement some of these control measures in a in a smaller environment? So that's, that's challenging, um, which lays to the third thing, Mr. Dunbar, which is makes it economically not viable. I can tell you from the perspective of operating today that we are, we run at a 50% deficit of what it costs to hold that land and the development costs. So versus what we can generate with snow revenue from our clients. However, it's a protectionary measure for the rest of our business. No one is going to develop on the private side a new site in the near future that's not going to include a corporation or somebody that has excess land that can meet these criteria. I would I, I, I would be highly suspect if we thought that you would have a, a whole number of private people like us coming to apply for some snow, new snow disposal sites on new land. Um, the last piece of trash. Trash is a challenge. Um, it's a balance between between, you know, we've talked about, you see the private snow operators do multiple multiple um, processing on their sites, whether it's snow, topsoil, or gravel, or whatever it may be. You see them out there in the summertime dozing the snow. Part of that is actually trash mitigation in, in a lot of respects because 
um, private snow sites deal with a completely different environment than what you will see in the municipal site. Municipal sites were pulling snow off the right of ways. There's typically not any curbs, um, uh, carts from grocery stores, I mean, trees, logs, blocks of concrete, whatever you can imagine will come in there, along with, you can imagine Taco Bell, McDonald's, any place that you out there where there's a high trash trash environment, the snow, it gets all through the snow belt. As the snow freezes and it starts to deflate in, in the spring and it comes down, it's stuck in that crust of brown stuff that you see. You, you in essence, are picking snow around all of that, but it is a daily, weekly um, uh, laborers out there just trying to pick, pick the trash out and reduce the unsightliness. Um, the challenge with that is from a, from a operational perspective is uh, it's expensive. Uh, to it's we used to have we used to have our kids do it in our other stuff. And I should say that we operate we also operate as the operator of one of the municipal snow dumps over behind part of the high school. So we deal with that snow dump also. It's a different operating environment there for us than our than our little private site over in South Anchorage. Uh, but it's not safe. I won't let my kids go out there anymore. Hypodermic needles, um, you you name it, sharps, all kinds of stuff that comes into those sites. Um, is uh, it's steel toed boots and leather work gloves and knickers and um, it's challenging. Yeah, that's I mean, comment wise, that's pretty much. Yeah. Just from the municipal side, but we've, I mean, if you go to Tudor or Spruce Street, I mean, there's anything that you could conceivably ever have a been on the road is is in there yeah, when, it, sure. when it's gone. And so, what street maintenance does is they don't even begin the process of cleaning up the trash and all the rest of it, maybe, maybe other than the stuff that blows around until now. And so one of the difficult challenges is in a, because it needs to fully dry to be able to get a piece of equipment up there to like co collect that stuff. Like when we had that large snow year, like half a dozen years ago, they never got a chance to clean the pad because the pad was never, was never sufficiently like dried out to be able to get the equipment on there to do it. But I mean, what, what you said, there's no, not, you can, you cannot even begin to imagine the stuff that shows up there. One, one other challenge in a private site too, and, it, and it's a challenge in the DCM, uh, is, you know, the level of service that's required for private sites versus what the road service areas expect is night and day. So, you know, how many times have you traveled to the grocery store and you drove through a foot of snow on the roads, and you hit a, you hit a, a grocery store. It's plowed, and there's a layer of gravel on it, right? Well, imagine where the gravel goes. Every time we plow the snow, we plow it through the plow. We load it up. We haul it through the snow dump. I would venture to say I've got 3,000 tons of gravel from this winter sitting on the floor of our snow dump right now. So no matter what I do for design. It changes every year based on how much gravel comes into the into the site, and you know every so many years you can go harvest it and you know grade it back up. But it's it's definitely we pick up a ton more gravel than you would probably experience in a municipal um, operation. Yeah, I, I just before we move on to well, I'm not sure what that's about, but um, I, I wanted to ask for the municipal folks. So what we've heard is that private snow storage is now basically uneconomical. We know that or are building new facilities is, and old facilities are starting to close. We know this is a critical need. So is our vision then that basically it's going to become a you know a utility or, or, or a public service the way that roads are, that it's going to be basically almost exclusively provided by municipal and state government? Or are we going to change the environment in some way where we want the private sector to step into this? I think it's a combination of both, uh, minus the uh, we're going to become a municipal monopoly or utility. The, the municipal uh, government, as you probably are aware, is actively looking at um, a new snow uh, storage site to serve as West Anchorage, um, and it will be a municipally, you know, if it goes forward, municipally designed, operated, managed site to help accommodate 
some of the loads that are currently leaving West Anchorage to go to other parts of town because of the lack of snow storage. So it's, it's going to be a combination of both. We as a city need to increase our capacity to accommodate snow, but I think also there's a meaningful policy discussion, which is part of the reason why we brought this to you, about balancing the challenges in operating private snow disposal sites, which I think are a vital uh, part of the city's you know, year-round climate, and balancing you know, the neighborhood and, and water quality protections that are in place today. And it's a, it's a like I said earlier, it's a delicate line to walk, but it is certainly a policy call that we want all of us to start thinking about because the, and we, Tim and I were just talking back here, we have not completed a comprehensive analysis of the total snow storage capacity of the whole, but we are going to, and I think what you'll see is that it's surprisingly little for a city of our size and increasing, as you heard Mr. Strong say. So it's an important issue. And I think right in line with that too, I mean, we, the municipality doesn't have enough and we have the same problem with sites that I mean, nobody wants to. Do. I mean, there's the, there's the whole operations part of it, but there's also the whole thing. Nobody wants to give up 40 acres of land that could potentially be developed to just have it sit with snow melting on it for six right. months a year. And so I know even like you know at the HLB level, like they're not yeah. thrilled with the idea of land that could go into development just just being used to have yeah. snow start on it all year. Yeah. I have one more comment. If I could. Um, of course. But uh, well, no, I'll hear your comment then I have a question. I think that um, one, one piece really more applies to, to our assembly members and, and, and our planners too is that, you know, as a contractor in the summertime too, we, we look at all kinds of plant sets that come, come across our, our desk. Most of those plant sets have a requirement for snow removal because they, they're exceeding their percentage of parking that they're allowed to do. So you've got a developer who's trying to maximize the building structure which means that they don't have snow storage, which means there's a haul off requirement that, that what I see in practical terms is we're not enforcing that, which means that we haven't created an emergency yet on the snow storage side, but if we were to enforce those requirements, we would create an emergency. So it's, it's it, it, that's something that I think the city has to look at as, as a balance. Well, the use a real, you said something that's really interesting to me and, and I hadn't really thought about it. Is parking and snow storage, are those in competition with each other or are they the same thing? So Can you take parking and then put snow on top of it? And if not, I would love to trade parking for snow storage. No, no. So uh, you, can use, you, you can use your over, if you're required to have five parking spaces, but you provide ten, you can use the five that are not required for your temporary your snow storage. So if we lower the parking requirement from five to three, they could use eight for snow storage. Correct. Ooh. There's your solution right there. Because you can only have three people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 Maybe and, and, your and, 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 room have giant parking lots. That's what you asked, but really what drives that, and the reason why you don't see a lot of enforcement is because it's all market driven. Yeah. If, if Diamond Mall at Thanksgiving has 30 of their parking spaces covered in snow, believe me, they're going to, right before the sales hit, they're, they're clearing that out. Sure. Um, for the rest of the year, they recognize that they probably have a couple extra spaces they can they can call it. Um, a lot of businesses recognize that you know, even when we offer parking reduction sometimes and allow them to do that, they still want their extra parking because they know from a business model that that's what they need to be functioning. And then it's also the balance of okay, we can lower parking, but then are we going to be spilling that problem over onto our streets because now you have spillover and it's. And, and you see like cars on the street parking there, but right. we don't so use the street for yeah. snow storage. We right. do. Yeah, we do. We'll use the right or we'll use the sidewalks. The sidewalks. Yeah. sidewalks. Yeah, part, part of the street. And I also add that uh, uh, irregardless of the parking question, regardless of the parking question, um, there are a number of private property owners who, because they have low risk tolerance from a liability perspective, have a strict no snow anywhere policy. So a lot of Mr. Draghi's clients in particular, I know this is the case, which is why the pressure exists for his site. They absolutely don't want an inch of snow on any part of their property because of the fault concerns. So there's, and that's changing, that's shifting. So the idea of on-site storage is not universal. Uh, and, and I personally feel, and I think you would agree, that you're gonna see more and more private property owners who contract out snow services 
asking for that complete removal all the time. But so I can add one more thing. So the very ordinance that you're going to be seeing soon, because it's not just the parking areas that you can use for snow storage, it's also your landscaping areas. So we're actually putting forward a landscape um, design criteria amendment that will allow a lot more flexibility to allow low impact development, which allows us to use our landscape areas if they design an appropriate way to include snow storage and or other storm water runoff. So that's another way of looking at the issue of, of also solving on site. Because yes, a lot of businesses do have a low threshold and tolerance, but it's also a high expense to remove snow. Sure. So a lot of them are, a lot of smaller businesses specifically are really just keeping it on site because they can't, it's a lot cheaper than, than hauling it off. But Jeff, I can probably speak more to the landscape and how that happens. Yeah, I mean, I hope, we're hoping to be able to, I mean, I mean, again and again, we hear during the development process that, you know, the city asks for parking, the city asks for stormwater, the city asks for landscaping, you know, and like suddenly now I have a developed site and no room for even building. Um, and so we're working with planning to try and be able to use some of the stormwater requirements for things like open space and landscaping and the rest of it. And it's been, it, I, I'm, Chris is helpful, I think, I think it will lead to good things. Yeah. One, one other thing you'll that- be, You'll be saying that in about the September tax rate that should be going out. To throw one more wrench in everything too, because it's something we haven't touched on here. But I certainly know when I was over at the health department, it was something to deal with all the time. One of the other challenges with snow dumps, people hate living near them, and and it really impacts. Um, so Spruce Street is perfect in terms of a lot of things, but it has some hour restrictions on it because there's neighbors nearby. It's been a while since we've gotten complaints about Tudor, but that has happened before. But one, I know one of the private sites that I worked with in the past was Ron, Ron Webb's over in Petersburg, and he's, you know, he has he had some of own issues. But his primary thing is that's an extremely valuable, like in the same sense that yours is valuable for your clients, that's valuable for his clients, and he has gone to like no end to try and reduce noise problems there because there's just no, I mean, there's like no other place that he can put the facility, and there's really no end to the fact. I mean he's always trying to figure out a way to fit in better with the community. And so I think that's like, you know, price of land, the size and the location, I mean, you really start to get a lot of factors that work against, like, like prep, like, I mean, making it an easy economical operation. So even um, with the Clutin out of site four being so far out, that because they do have the development of water and reserve, they've actually had, anybody that's coming in to buy now has to sign basically an agreement that says they acknowledge that there is a snow disposal site and an active uh, gravel operation adjacent to them, letting everybody know that way it's it's pure, it's transparent. Um, and I think those things are helpful because when people know what they're buying into the situation. And the reality is, is there's there there is a, a true noise associated. Yeah, with and it. and it's things like backup alarms, yeah. which are just not gonna go <laughs> away for other. I mean, they're, they're, like there, there's just no there's no way that's. You know, there's no way they're not going to use them. The other thing too with noise is, you know, you get a load of snow that sticks, and so you start pounding. You have to knock the tail, the the gate, the the, the bed of the truck a little bit, because otherwise you're going back to get a load and you're you're already halfway full. So there's there's issues. Thanks, uh, Crystal. Yeah, some questions or comments, or maybe it'll all run together. Um, you know, I guess back to the. Um, the idea of removing trash from some of these um, disposal sites. Um, to me, it sounds like we're creating some mini landfills, you know, just because of the nature of having to deal with all of that. So I'm not sure that there's, well, there's obviously some concerns there, but I don't think I really have a question about it, but it'll be an interesting conversation to see, you know, how we can mitigate some of that or m make it so that that's allowable. Because it just certainly seems to me, that especially when you're putting gravel in there, you're building mounds. I mean, you're literally changing the elevation of, of some of these sites. So um, that would be an interesting. Oh, I see a, a hand go up about something. Can can I can we interrupt sure. long enough no. to? Okay, then I want to continue. This. How we manage that over time is is we actually don't let that build up. As as time goes on, we doze all of that gravel to a corner and we rescreen it all. We remove all the trash wow. and we haul it to the dump. And then the gravel that we rescreen, we recycle and we. Again in the future, 
So you can recycle gravel. Okay. So yeah, so That's like the part of our operation like operational plan is is we actually we sweep all of our own plants. We recycle all the gravel that we sweep up every spring. Um, goes to our storage facility, we re-screen it, remove all the detrimental debris, cigarette butts, whatever, screen it back down to real gravel again, just like the gravel that we would, and haul off the deleterious material. Okay, that is interesting. That kind of goes into another whole road um, issue in terms of how we gravel our roads, because I'm, I'm pretty sure at Chigiat Birchwood, we don't recycle anything that we clean up in the, um, at the end of the year. All the street sweepers take yeah. that to the landfill. I mean, it, yeah. So anyway, it's just real thought. quick on the trash tip. Oh, the Klutners actually use it as an uh, economic development kind of job creation. So they actually hire their shareholders to come out and pick up the snow or they pick up the trash. Pick up trash. So they use it as a form of employment, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Good to a positive outcome, I guess. Yeah. Oh gosh, I see all kinds of Sorry, but yeah, I, I, well, I wanted to go on. Oh, no, go ahead. That's okay, but I just had. Are, is that a question, or you wanted to? I have a question. On. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll go to Magnet. Um, well, then, can I? Okay, go ahead. Just so can finish, and we'll go to Magnet. Sorry. Before. Maybe the point is that we have a lot to talk about in all of this um, because there's a lot of different facets to um, the issues here, and um, I, I guess one of the things that I was interested in hearing more about is whether or not we think the market would just bear an increase in um, hauling. Uh, costs. I know with Chigak Birchwood Eagle River Road uh, Rural Road Service, um, we purposefully don't haul a lot of snow. Um, if you're out in that area, there are a couple of places that are high density, and we and we clear snow and we haul it off. But for the most part, it just goes off to the side of the road because we know it's so expensive. And we just recently did uh, take the contract with the Klutna um, to be able to. Um, have a disposal site but anyway um, I guess what I'd be interested in knowing is at what point do we think you could even do a cost increase that would offset that because the biggest challenge I think is how much snow we get every year I mean from year to year we may have no snow next year um, or we could have you know another one of those record snows and um, how you adjust or adapt to that in terms of how you're um, uh, costing out uh, your, your operation. I, I don't know how you you deal with that. I, I just don't see how we can do something from this perspective that actually makes that more lucrative or cost effective or uh, whatever. But that would really be an interesting conversation to see if there's a way to balance that in what we do in terms of um, you know any ordinances that we put forward for either increasing the number of storage lots or uh, finding ways to make them uh, less volatile with uh, EPA requirements. Um, anyway, I guess I just see a whole lot of uh, spokes to this wheel, and that will be an interesting uh, conversation to get through some of this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to make sure we get to the, the Wells question. I do have one quick question. Do we have a projected capacity of need for stone oaks in the comprehensive land use plan? Yeah, yeah. Do we have a projected need of capacity for snow dumps in the comprehensive land so use plan? That was yeah. one of the points I was trying to make earlier is we don't we haven't sat down and done the numbers on what the current capacity is of existing sites and I, I, I don't think I can answer that question yet other than anecdotally, which is uh, the experience, the lived experience of private contractors is that the demand for hauling is going up. So, so as part of that project of determining current capacity, are you going to work towards pr projected capacity, knowing there's a lot of other factors yeah, at play, so that we look at that in terms of our overall land use plan? Absolutely. And, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, 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 the municipality, in our own activities already have that deficit, which is why we, we are looking at um, new sites, grading sites for West Anchorage, but it's not just the West Anchorage. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just had a question kind of regarding the dump and the recycling of the gravel. Is the dump fees tied into what you charge clients so it doesn't come out of pocket? And do you get like a credit for the gravel recycling? No. So I would love I would love I would love to say that, that that's the case. Uh, you will I guess the short answer is if you look on Craigslist in the spring you'll see sweeping contractors looking for any place under the sun to dump gravel um, because that's their business is sweeping. Um, our business is a little more encompassing 
and we, by virtue of, of the type of business we've run in the past, we just have that experience and how to make it work for us. Um, it does reduce our overall operating costs. It helps subsidize the snow disposal site that we currently have. Um, however, it's it's for most operators, it's not economically viable. Again, it's a it's just got to be part of the whole deal now. It, it, it's the same thing as hauling snow. If you're sweeping on East Anchorage, you know, and you're a sweeping contractor, you're looking for somewhere anywhere close on East Anchorage to dump that versus hauling it all the way to a designated site somewhere. Um, so, you know, I would say 80% of the gravel that's dumped up in the spring is dumped in somebody's backyard, building lots some hole they're trying to fill somewhere along the line. That's a general rule of thumb. Thanks. Anything else? Um, do you want to ask a wells question? Um, we said it didn't apply to wells or water runoff. It's just MS4. So is there anything that applies to how snow dumps may affect wells and water runoff? And of course, I have a, cl or a constituent in my district who's got this issue with wells. We've heard about it at the assembly. Um, so I'm kind of just trying to, I understand there's a, um, perhaps a donut hole, hole in the regulation between the state <coughs> and the municipality, but maybe you could kind of. Okay, how about uh, assembly members, I'll tell how a big picture and we drill okay. down to the wellhead. Right. So wellhead protection is done in the municipality by the Development Services Department on site staff. We have a limited jurisdiction or limited delegation of authority from ADEC, the state uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. We can only regulate what they say we can regulate. They have only uh, delegated regulation authority to us for single family and duplex uh, well, or well servicing those uh, size properties, uh, nothing larger in terms of uh, their regulations. They retain jurisdiction to regulate if they choose to do so, say a well that serves a fourplex. We don't have that jurisdiction right now. A change to that would require a change in state law as well as an ordinance. After that, you pick up the additional admin cost for, um, for uh, the staff to administer that. And also, to, uh, at this time, there's no state standard for a set distance of a wellhead from a snow dump of any size. And because of zoning, when most of ours are I-2 now, it doesn't matter. Where you have uh, one of the grandfathered rights, it becomes an issue. So there is no state standard. So if you create that state standard that, um, or you create a muni standard that you can't have a certain distance, and then you have a well within that distance, you, um, you, we would then have to deal with what do we do with that well that is within the distance. Under the DEC construct delegated to us, we, would, we regulate wells. Uh, we don't regulate, uh, we won't be regulating snow dumps. We'd have to deal with how, uh, when we've uh, basically, by a, a, a assembly action taking away a right to have a well, how do we adjust for that landowner? Do, is it a non-conforming right? Or is it uh, some sort of any uh, assistance with buying into uh, the AWU system? But uh, there isn't a clean mechanism there to do it at this point. Uh, I would add though that that does not, none of this affects the ability of two adjacent landowners to do a civil action to sort out if one feels the other uh, um, the water is being contaminated by the snow dump next door. They, there's nothing that forecloses them from pursuing litigation to address that, as a, any other issue between two landowners who are adjacent to each other. And rather than having the, the government step in, it, it, there's an opportunity for them to resolve it between themselves. That has been the clearest explanation of this situation I have gotten. Thank you, and I would just say I know that this individual has been emailing with you, and I don't think she's got, um, Christy, I don't think that she has that clarity that this MS4 thing doesn't apply to her, so I would be really clear about that. I spoke with her yesterday, and she seemed to think that she was on a path to resolution, and that's not really the case. So I will follow up with her as well. So. If, if I may, that's, that's, there's a, and I, I'm not throwing shade on this out, there's a lot of misunderstandings in her analysis of the current situation. There's also a lot of options out there, but all of them are either currently non-legal, uh, outside of our jurisdiction, the legal path, or 
Uh, definitely on the costly side. We, we did specifically ask Abel the question of either creating a water improvement district in Kern or other neighbors. But there's, there are additional residential properties over there that are serviced by wells. Uh, or for what an AWU extension, uh, a water extension service would cost. And it's not cheap. And as Mr. Noel alluded to, um, you know, if at some, some point there is a need to resolve this issue in that way, that's probably the most costly but best way for the municipality to be involved is through our utility. If in an area like North Star near Bosco's, this area, the fact that they are not on municipal water is, I think, a little bit of a shame. And so, I thought I was recording that. Uh, so that would be, that would be, I think, our preference is to head down that road and have a conversation with the utility. Do we have, you guys have costed it out. Um, can I get those numbers? Yeah. That would be, that would be helpful. Um, and then, great. That, again, thank you. It's that was the most clarity I would gotten on the situation in one in shot. You're six figures, so for that water line. Okay. Yeah, it's good to know, though. It's a good data point to have. Thank you. Maybe another question on that, though, is if uh, this woman came and said the water in her well is not good water, so now she's got a fourplex. I, I think that's a misstatement. She's never tested she the water in her well. She refuses to test the water in her well. Because she might find out something she doesn't Correct. want to find yeah. out. Yeah. So are there yeah. solutions? Because you know, we just, if a well is grouted, it can water, surface water most likely won't go down if it's contaminated. And she said hers isn't grouted, but you could go back and grout a well, right? And that's not hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's really cheap. Okay. That's based on the assumption, though, that it would that the water is running in over the top as opposed to down into the aquifer. And I think for the shape of that, the, the, yeah, the topography there would be, to me, counterintuitive to think that the water was coming in over the top. Oh, really? If, yeah. if it was actually infiltrating at all and without a water sample to indicate there's an issue and then a plume analysis to see if it came from there or the old Gary's trucking uh, the main industrial facility there the main times industrial facilities have an ample opportunity for uh, some surface water contamination and Jeff or Chrissy can chime in but the topography actually slopes towards the wetland which is to the north oh, okay. is, is it possible then to just she could drill another 100 feet or a deeper well maybe if there's a problem that's a way cheaper than hooking up to the I don't water, know that so. we know there's a problem in yeah, terms because she's not tested it, but I've just been trying to make sure we're getting a navigation of the processes. Well, and what I heard is there's no hope unless you see some neighbors. <laughs> well, <laughs> Clarity. Can I ask a question? I, I guess I, this, this situation, the well is for a fourplex, is that what you're saying? Yes. So she's got a rental property where she refuses to test the water, and the people that are renting her property are using that water. Right. So. She might be sue her neighbor. Her if she's poisoning her renters, they could sue her for much more than she's gonna be able to sue her neighbors. It's been conveyed. Okay. She's gonna yeah, I mean, she's gonna give a kid lead poisoning or something. Mr. Chair. Chris? Yeah, on that subject, I'd ask the question of wouldn't it be reasonable to contemplate the requirement of an annual water quality test at that one site? I understand that they have some grandfather rights to be there, but there are definitely some realistic harms that if other people are around or on wells, and we know that there's all kinds of pollutants that come from these sites. And so that is definitely an area that uh, raises my concern. So testing the runoff from the uh, snowstorm site or testing? The groundwater around that site. I don't know that we can actually go in after the fact that I'm not performing. We've never done that. To implement that requirement. It would also, one of the challenges is that, first of all, they would need to get a baseline. There is other industrial uses. So to determine where anything came in from, I think would be next to impossible. I also would just assume she's only owned that property for like four to six years from my understanding. The Service Business Center has been in operation for much longer than that. So she was fully aware that she was purchasing property adjacent to a store store in which I, I get that, Michelle, but I think that maybe it's us who performs an annual COSA. There seems to be a real public health concern in that location, and it seems like we should know. Somebody should know, or I don't know who the responsible party is, but that we should establish a benchmark, a baseline, and, and see. Because maybe it is still healthy and clean, maybe it's not. And going forward, maybe every year we'll know it's gotten a little weird and why it did it. 
And so I'm not sure what the tactic would be to do that. Mr. Schutte tells me that the, these folks are really heavily regulated, and so um, I'm not sure what we could do, but it seems reasonable to have or require an annual COSA of some kind to see if that water is poisoning people. Mr. Chair, Mr. Constant, the property owner in question so far has refused to test her well, and we can't compel her to test her well as far as I know. I get that, and you understand why. The reality is if she tests it and if she finds that it's polluted, then that liability falls on her when she's not the cause of that, but she would just be the one to have discovered it. And so it's like one of those phenomenons when you buy a polluted site, you become the no. owner of that polluted no. site. No, that's not correct. As sure as when it comes to oil spills and other other chemicals, you I mean, that, this is pretty clear matter of real estate law. And so it's one of those things. If she didn't cause it, she doesn't want to own it. All right, Bob, do you have a comment? Um, to uh, Assemblymember Constant, we have when we do COSAs, we do it on existing wells. There aren't existing wells on the snow dump site if we were to try to sample the sites around there. Also, we have no requirement for subsurface water sampling for any other industrial site or the authority to do so, to my knowledge, inside uh, the municipality. And, and if I might, I think that's the whole purpose of this conversation is to understand where we have done our job or not and if we need to grant new powers, if we can grant new powers to actually do that because these uh, snow sites have a very unique, different function. They're literally percolating water into the system and uh, that percolation is gathering up all the pollutants that are on the ground in every direction and concentrating them into one place. And so uh, I don't think there's another use within the municipality that actually does that. And so there definitely warrants some heightened level of scrutiny on this kind of a user. And as I understand, they're highly regulated because they're problematic already. It seems to me like there's some additional regulation that we ought to contemplate. So I just wanted to clarify what, what Bob just did, this was before his time here. So there's actually been two um, uses where we actually did require baseline, actually I think three sites where we've required baseline testing and then subsequent uh, water monitoring. That's equipment the site one, that was the old gravel pit, um, next to, next to uh, Fire Eagle, right? I'm trying to think which creek that was. Fire um, Creek. Fire Creek, thank you, I'm just Fire Eagle. Um, site four, and uh, for the snow disposal site, and then their Birchwood, um, next to the virtual airport, they had a gravel activity for 150 acres that they mined out. Um, that one was gravel, and in that one, there was well testing that was done on neighbors because a lot of neighbors had indicated that they already had uh, problems with their well. But we had to get that, they had, I couldn't have had to get the permission for those folks to take water samples. Um, you can't just go on somebody else's property and take water samples from their well. So that was one instance that anybody who did so, did so voluntarily and, and allowed the equipment to do that. Um, for sites one and four, because they're adjacent to creeks, those both had, um, as part of their conditional use permit approval, a requirement to do water testing, but they also included the opportunity to do baseline. So they could establish that baseline before they went in there. And then all subsequent tests were based on that baseline and then moving in so that there was a clearer connection to that being the cause. I guess just kind of knowing that background, we do have the ability to do that moving forward, but I think there's a lot of issue with doing that on a, on a retroactively for a site that has a lot of other industrial uses, um, and we don't know what the clear baseline would be, and we don't know where that, that point would be. And it also just, we're, we cannot go onto private property and take well samples. Yeah, and I, I think I hear clearly where you're coming from there, Michelle, and I agree with you that there are challenges and I think it, it requires us to be as creative as we can to come up with a solution um, because, you know, who in the end is going to be liable? Probably us if a lot of people get poisoned and she goes bankrupt and there are sick children and all of the parade of horribles that could come out of this. Um, we're the deep pockets. It's our land, our process. And so we would be wise to contemplate when we have substantial uh, residential uses, surrounding industrial uses, and water is involved that we tread carefully. Okay, thanks. So I've got a question from Forrest, and we've got to be wrapping up pretty quick here. Well, I just think this is probably a topic for another day, but it does seem like you've identified an interesting gap in our law 
um, because I'm concerned about these renters. Renters are often not sophisticated parties. They probably are unnoticed that they're, they probably think, some of them probably think they're on city water. Maybe on this particular case. But my question is, why don't we have a requirement for large rental properties, say fourplexes or larger? They do do periodic well testing. It doesn't have to be every year, but some amount of well uh, of well testing. Is that something that's done in other communities or something you've contemplated as a requirement? Answer, and Bob will give you a longer answer. Short answer is we don't regulate Class C wells. The authority to regulate Class C wells lives in DEC, not in the municipality. So it would be a state law change if we wanted them to do periodic. Because I'm fine with people if we got private well, you, you know, but if you're renting to a large class of people that aren't on notice and you're not testing your water quality, it's a real problem. But there are tests. We're working with LV to close no, those all required tests. So there, there are shared wells. There are, I know. Not not for seeds. seeds. Not for seeds. When you go over a certain size, um, uh, any, anything above a duplex is within uh, DEC's jurisdiction. They, uh, they may not actually regulate them. It's in their jurisdiction. When they go over a well that serves an average of 25 people, there are those tests you're talking about. So there's a gap between between over a duplex to 25. That's a pretty large chunk of rental properties in Anchorage. So that's enough. I mean, when I was over at the health department, but most more, I did the on-site like pump health stuff for wells when there when there was not the program was still over at the health department. And the, I mean, so this probably goes back almost 20 years. The, the state has just washed their hands of seas and not given us authority to regulate them or... Can you guys come up with a proposal that's solid enough that we can put it in our legislative program to talk to the state about? We're working in the town with our state folks to close the hole as well. Okay, well, if you can Actively. come up with something, if you can come up with something that's so solid enough in the next two, three months, we could have it part of our legislative program. Okay. So that Anchorage itself would be like, hey, please resolve this. Because it sounds like what we want is the ability to take that regulatory theory back or not? Well, Chris is saying no. I think our preference would be DC has done, a, uh, historically has done a great job with Class C wells and above. And ideally, that's what we'd love to see. Now, the fiscal reality of what's happening in Juno makes that a challenge. And you would add yet another, what should be a state responsibility to the municipality. It comes at a cost. Uh, so I think our first preference would be fix the problem at DEC sure. first. If that's not going to work, then talk about alternatives. But that, I think as far as you're referring to closing the donut hole, that would be our preference. Is DEC is well more, is way more equipped for this because Class C wells exist across the state, right? And they have that authority across the state. It's not an Anchorage problem. They should be doing this. But absent that, I do. And when you say this, do you mean they themselves would be doing tests or just requiring these landowners to periodically do a test? All of the above. They, they have the authority to regulate Class C wells and everything that that means. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, like that thing you get if you're on ABU, like the quarterly water quality monitoring, yeah. that's, that's what C's don't have. All right. Well, thank you. Um, good discussion. Thanks for bringing this up. Yeah, so, you. we have at least one ordinance on the Maybe changes to landscaping coming forward, and is there you're, you're going to do more studies like what's our capacity and so on, and right. see if yeah. something's needed? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the, the green infrastructure ordinance that Michelle's group is bringing forward that also deals with snow storage. And then this uh, comprehensive capacity, current capacity question is a good one that we'll try to answer right away. Good. All right, and Tim and Jennifer, thanks for coming over. You have a lot of valuable information. Can I put if, if anyone's interested, if you want to think you're going to be interested or not interested in, but checking out one of the snow dumps in like June, July, it's really informative and it's actually pretty amazing to see like it in operation. I mean, as part of the RFP that PME put out for the snow dump, a couple of the contractors, uh, like we went on field trips to you know, just, just you know me and the engineers. And just to see how, how it works, because it's, it's amazing, because you have this giant black mound of junk over here on the Spruce Street pad, and then just about 100 yards away, you have water just crystal clear coming out and going into the wetlands there. So it's, 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 hum it's wonky, but it's kind of cool. So if anyone's interested, uh, you know, next year. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.